Okay, so I'm going to talk about the evolution of a pairing-based uh, zero-knowledge proof. So this is sort of like a, a step back and, and looking at the, the history. Uh, I was, um, all this started when I was uh, visiting UCLA, where the postdocs I was with Amit Zahai and Rafael Ostrovsky, and, uh, and we were just talking to Dave that we can't believe it's more, been more than a decade ago that, <laughs> that all, the, all this started. Um, so there are some, some recurring motives that I'll, I'll try to, to draw out in, in this talk, uh, namely the, the choice of language, which kind of statements you want to prove, uh, the type of security that, that you get from these proof system uh, and the efficiency that, that you get from them. And there are many more things I could look at. I could look at the properties of the proofs of knowledge, simulation sound and all that kind of stuff, but oh, I mean, I only have so much time. Okay. Um, so, so, so I'm not going to stay right with pairings because of course a lot of these things were already issues before we even started this work, right? So, so any good story about zero knowledge starts at the beginning of the original life, uh, GMR 85, right? That defines zero knowledge in terms of completeness, soundness, and, and zero knowledge. And constructed some, uh, some specific uh, proof systems for specific uh, language quadratic residuosity. And, and that immediately following this, uh, this paper it led to an enormous explosion of, of work, right? So I'll, I'll give you a few seconds so you can see if you can recognize the pictures and you know, if, if you've been in, in the field for a long time, maybe map them to the specific papers. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so, so this is a GMW, right, where they proved that, you know, NP complete languages have uh, uh, proof systems and looked at three coloring of, of graphs. Um, this is Brassar Kupo, right, security uh, against an unbounded attacker. So this is the unbounded attacker with lots of computing power. Um, this one, Killian's paper on succinct proofs, right? So notice the arrows are much shorter than the other ones. <laughs> right, and here we have proofs of knowledge that not only is the statement true, but the proof actually knows the witness that the statement is true. And this is non-interactive zero knowledge to a common reference string model. Okay, so we have this biodiversity of, of all sorts of uh, nice uh, things uh, about zero knowledge, right? All of this was uh, theoretical work, right? So that's, of course, the question, you know, what, what can you get that's actually practical and, and useful? Um, and that we have examples of as well, right? Because uh, Schnorr came along and you know, works before that on, on using factoring-based uh, assumptions, right? So creating discrete log-based uh, signatures, which is essentially a three-move identification protocol that you make non-interactive with Fiat Shamir. Uh, and that led to, to more generalizations in terms of uh, Sigma protocols. Um, and of course, sort of like merged into this question, you know, can you do it generally for any language? Um, um, so the answer to that was yes. Um, and also looking at some more specific language that was sort of somewhat crypto friendly, right? So what do cryptographers often do? Well, they work over some field and they do additions and multiplications and that, right? And uh, uh, Kramer and Damgall looked at arithmetic circuit satisfiability and built sort of discrete log based proofs that could handle these kind of statements, right? And, and Sort of like the work we've seen in pairings with snarks and so forth, looking a little ahead, right? We get all these succinctness properties and so forth. But you know, that's something that's also present in, in this fr framework here, right? And you can make it non-interactive with uh, a Fiat Shamir, right? So, so we get, I got square root n and, and now logarithmic number of group elements and we kind of get bullet proofs and, and all these kind of things. Uh, and I also wanted to throw in so that sort of, of course, different proof models, right? That's also the nice designated verify proofs by Kramer Schub that was really useful in getting chosen ciphertext attack security. Okay, so pairing based proofs, right? So, um, so go back. Um, 
again in 2005, 2006, right? We were looking at, at this question of, uh, of this, basically this matrix here, right? And, and we had interactive proofs and we had non-interactive proofs in the common reference string model, right? And, and for computational zero knowledge, that was sort of a solved theoretical problem, right? We knew how to get proofs for all of NP using interactive techniques, right? And you can base it on, on one-way functions. Okay, and, and Bloomfeld and Mikali showed that, you know, you can also make that non-interactive in the common reference string model. Okay, so, so great. We can get either interaction or non-interaction and, and it's a really a, a solved problem, right? And then the question is, you know, okay, but what if we have a really powerful attacker, right? You know, what do, kind of guarantees do we get if, if the recipient of the proof actually has a lot of computing power and might decrypt things and so forth? And there in the interactive setting, Brassard and Cripo had very, also very quickly realized that, well, you can get perfect zero knowledge, right? So you have this everlasting privacy. The remaining question then, which was open, was this question of, you know, what if you want to have a non-interactive proof and you have unconditional zero knowledge. And the existing techniques at that point just didn't work at all, right? It's sort of like a, known as a hidden bit string model and it's really kind of at its core encrypts some bits so you can just decrypt if you have unbounded power, right? And then of course you can see whether it's uh, a simulation or, or a true proof, right? Of course there were sort of hints that you could get unconditional zero knowledge because Future Mir suggested that in mean, the Future Mir model. You can get that, right? So the question we were really interested in was, you know, could you do this from some sort of standard assumption, right? Because we know that there are some weaknesses as well with a random oracle model or something that Yale, for instance, has shown that, you know, the examples of identification protocols that just break down in, in the random oracle model. Okay. So we were fortunate because right about that time, um, pairing-based crypto was also really taking off, right? So um, in particular, in 2005, uh, Bonego and Nissim suggested uh, double homomorphic encryption based on pairings. So that was a really nice uh, uh, result, and it's sort of like something that also, I think, motivated the work that since kind of increased the degree of homomorphicity, so we got fully homomorphic in encryption with very different techniques, but still I think this must have been inspiration to, to that kind of line of work, right? So it was sort of really uh, beautiful paper, sort of very simple to read, right, but also really with a, a strong, strong impact. So, so what they looked at was uh, groups with a pairing of composite order. Okay, and suggested an encryption scheme where you have an element that has full order and then you have an element that just has order Q, right? And then the way you encrypt is that you take G and raise it to M and H and raise it to R and multiply those together, right? So it looks like a Peterson commitment, but it's over this composite order group, okay? And the point is that since H, R, H only lives in this order Q subgroup, it can only hide things in the order Q subgroup, right? So this M here is actually encoded unconditionally in the order P subgroup, okay? And it turns out that if you know the factorization of N, so that's the secret key, right, then you can actually raise all this to, to Q and kill off H and you have something which just has G raised to M, right? And then you can extract M if M is small. Okay, so that was sort of precondition for this encryption scheme to work. So the really cool thing about it was that it was double homomorphic, right? So if additive properties, you just multiply two ciphertexts together and it's easy to see you get encryption of the sum of those two plain texts, right? But then the real power came from this pairing because if you take two ciphertexts and you pair them together, and you work out all the mathematical details, what you get is actually a pairing of G with G raised to the power A times B, right? Some multiplication. And then you have a pairing with some other stuff which is paired with this H here, 
right? But remember, H has the order Q. So this thing here on, on the right-hand side lives in the order Q subgroup. Whereas on the left-hand side, we have G paired with G. That has full order. So it encodes A times B, right? And again, with the same secret key, if you know the factorization, you can extract A times B, right? So now you have this double homomorphic encryption scheme where you can both add plain text and you can multiply plain text, okay? Why is it not fully homomorphic? Well, because you're, after you apply the pairing, then you are mapping into the target group and you can't do any more pairings. Okay. Okay, so taking this pairing-based proof and combining that with non-interactive zero-knowledge, it turns out you get non-interactive zero-knowledge with perfect and everlasting zero-knowledge. Okay, so we solved this problem, right? And how do we solve that? Um, so the core idea here is really you just think of a Boolean circuit or an arithmetic circuit or modulo P, right? So what you'll do is you'll just commit to all the wire values okay, that satisfy this circuit. Okay, so that's what we do here, and we get a bunch of ciphertext or commitments. Okay, now suppose we have an addition gate. Well, you just take the two commitments and you multiply them together and you get the sum, right? And now you have an encryption of the sum, the result of that gate. Okay, so the next, the hard question now is, well, okay, what if we have a multiplication gate, right? And, and the insight here is that this double homomorphic encryption property almost already gives us the solution to that um, uh, um, puzzle, right? So suppose we have three commitments. We have a commitment to A, and we have a commitment to B, and we have a commitment to C. And we want to prove that C is a product of A and B, right? What do we do? Well, we take the ciphertext with A and the ciphertext with B and we pair them together and now we have a ciphertext that's at A times B, right? And if this C here really is A times B, then that sort of balances out those two ciphertexts and all that remains is something of order, order Q, something with H. On the other hand, if C is false, it's not the product of A and B, then you would actually have some, some equation here that doesn't balance out, okay? Modulo P in, in the order P subgroup. So the trick is essentially now that you just do the, this pairing of, of the encryption of A and B, and the pairing of encryption C with just encoding of one, right? And that ought to be A times B and C times one, so they ought to be equal to each other if the proof is honest. And then, Everything else is something of order Q. So basically the proof you reveal is just something that you pair with H, okay? And because you're pairing with H and H has order Q, you are guaranteed that this proof here is not going to affect anything in the order P subgroup. And therefore really A times B is equal to C, <coughs> right? And if you have additions and you can handle multiplications, then you can just walk through the circuit and prove that everything is consistent with the gates. Okay, so, so it's easy to see that if uh, the order of H has order Q, right, then by these double homomorphic properties, because it's an encryption scheme, we get perfect soundness. Okay, so that's great. But the core observation here is that it's indistinguishable whether H has order Q or whether H has full order N. Right? But what happens if we're using an element H in this commitment scheme which has full order N? Right? Well, now a commitment looks like G to A and H to R, and both of them have full order N. It's just a Peterson commitment, right? It's perfectly hiding, and nothing leaks about the witness. Okay, so voila. Very simple kind of construction, right? Gives us perfect zero knowledge. And not only gave it us perfect zero knowledge, right, but it also turned out this is a really simple non-interactive zero knowledge proof. It's way more easy to, to read and it's um, way more efficient than what were the constructions at that time.
Okay, so there was a, a lot of work following on, on this uh, and, and sort of extracting all the kind of cool things that you could get with introducing pairings in the world of non-interactive zero knowledge. Okay, so one natural question you can of course ask is, you know, okay, we have these composite order groups, but you know, in real life we probably don't want to use composite order groups, right? We want to use prime order groups because they're more efficient and, and for various other reasons, okay? So, you know, so can you do this with prime order groups? And the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, and as a side gain of that, we also got slightly weaker security guarantee, privacy guarantees. We could get witness indistinguishable proofs where you actually don't have a common reference string at all. Okay. Um, the next question is, okay, so that's great. Now we have proof system which is really efficient for proving things about Boolean circuits and arithmetic circuit satisfiability, right? But back in those days, I mean, what did you really want to prove zero knowledge about, right? What was, for instance, the, the benefit of Schnorr protocols? Well, it, you know, you can take a group element, you can prove that you have an exponentiation and you can create a signature scheme, right? So when you're designing pairing-based cryptographic protocols, well, you have protocols that use these generic operations. They take elements and multiply them together or compute an exponentiation or they do a pairing or something like that, right? And it was natural then to ask, can we construct proof systems that work directly for those kind of operations, right? And, and I think it's interesting here that it's sort of a, a shift of thinking. So that had been already zero knowledge proofs for a lot of different types of language, right? Three coloring and Hamil Hamiltonian circuits in a graph. Uh, um, and, and Boolean circuit satisfiability and SAT formulas and things like that, right? But I think that was mostly driven by people wanting to construct a proof system. And then they were like, you know, oh, how the hell am I going to construct this proof system? Oh, it turns out that this NP-complete problem is nice for my purposes. And I think this was sort of like a little different. It's more like saying, what is it that we really want to prove? Right? And then selecting the language you know, that kind of corresponds to what we really want to do in, in the real world, and then constructing a proof system that works with that. Okay? And, and uh, Brent Waters, who was so like also involved in this discussion, and, and uh, together with uh, um, Xavier Boyen, they had some papers on uh, group signatures that also exploited these uh, properties. He, he formulated the way that you know these non-interactive zero knowledge proofs sort of in a natural way speak speak pairing, right? So that's a language pairing, and, and that's what they speak. Okay, and sort of the when we work more, um, we had a paper in two thousand eight that sort of gave efficient proofs for these kind of practical languages. So we're talking about for for each equation, you would pay a cost of a proof that was a few group elements, okay? So, so here we have um, a statement which is really a set of equations that just uses generic group operations, okay? So you can have equations that exploit the pairing. So maybe you have some, some pairings of group elements and so forth and it should give you something, okay? Or maybe you have uh, operations that involve group elements and exponents, and you do some sort of multi-exponentiation of, of different group elements with different secret exponents. Okay, or you have a quadratic equation where you have some field elements and you can add them together and you can multiply them together. Um, I guess this is the rank one constraint satisfaction problem, but you know we didn't use that name at that time because that came later. So there's a lot of this terminology that sort of like came later, so, so we didn't call it that. Uh, but really, you have a system of these kind of equations, right? And now you can formulate all sorts of pairing-based schemes or arithmetic circuits you want because R1 constraint systems are NP-complete. Okay, and you can just sort of write all these quadratic equations and you can give simple proofs for them. And each, for each equation, you basically pay a few group, number of group elements. Okay. So, so just to illustrate sort of what is sort of the, the step that we've taken here, right? I mean, so I kind of like to think about 
take a simple kind of statement of something you might prove in, in some kind of construction, right? So here's a ciphertext, I have a document. I'll give you those to you, and I'm claiming that the ciphertext has a digital signature on that document, right? And you could imagine some using some pairing-based digital signature for this, right? And if you wanted to use sort of state-of-the-art non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs in, back in those days, right, you would look through the literature, you find Killian and Petrang from 94, uh, that says you should write this out at a three set five formula and use the hidden bit model where you encrypt things and do some statistical sampling and then so forth, right? And I think, you know, we're talking about a terabyte to prove this kind of statement, right? Um, so it's great, it's non-interactive, uh, but you probably still don't want to attach it to an email. Uh, <laughs> right? Um, okay. So GOS proofs, they were great because they are actually efficient. So we could do Boolean circuit satisfiability um, and, and the cost would be sort of like a, a few group elements per, per gate, okay? Um, so it's great, it's efficient for language that we don't actually want to use, right? Because, you know, uh, it's not too often actually, in, at least in those days, I mean, now I guess you guys do actually use <laughs> circuit satisfier builds, but at least in those days, that's, that's not what we wanted. We were looking at, you know, concrete protocols. You want to construct a group signature, right? You don't want to reduce your statement to a circuit satisfiability problem than proving that. So it's sort of like we had efficient proofs for inefficient statements, <laughs> right? So, so the question is, okay, can you do something for practical language, right? And, and the answer to that was sort of in theory, yes, right? You could do pairing-based, uh, product-based kind of equations and you could prove those, so I kind of showed that. Um, um, but at that time, it was sort of a practical language but an inefficient solution because we were talking about like a few million group elements per uh, equation. And then finally, with this one, we kind of got both of them right, both a practical language and efficient proofs for it. And, and there we were talking about few group elements to prove this kind of thing. We're talking about a kilobyte or something like that to give a proof. So that was sort of like the early days of pairing-based non-interactive zero knowledge, right? And, and after having done this work, of course, you kind of get greedy, right? As a theoretician, right? You're looking at this and saying, okay, this is great, but, you know, it is a linear cost, right? For every gate in a circuit or every equation you want to prove something, you're paying a few group elements, right? So it's basically a linear cost, right? And can you get something that's even better than that? Okay, and there were already hints, of course, that, you know, maybe you could get something better than that, right? Because Killian had showed that you could get succinct zero knowledge arguments, right? Fiat Shamir had shown that you could make uh, interactive public coin arguments non-interactive with a hash function and, and Mikali had sort of like put those two together and said, okay, you can actually get succinct non-interactive arguments. Okay, um, and people also, you know, of course, interested in this from a theoretical perspective. Um, so these kind of terminology, snarks with a G and snarks with a K, right, came about. Uh, a, a bit later um, because people were interested in, in this uh, problem. So, so Gentry and Wicks kind of looked at it from a lower bounds uh, kind of uh, perspective and, and showed that you need to have non-falsifiable assumption to actually construct non-interactive arguments that are succinct. Um, huh? Yes, 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 correct. Okay, um, uh, and I forgot, was that Bitansky, Kiesa? Uh, huh? Canetti, yes, and, 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 and you. <laughs> um, defined uh, uh, snarks, okay, as succinct non-interactive arguments of, of knowledge. Um, it's interesting actually to look sort of like I was looking at the details of those definitions. Um, so this SNARK paper actually has three different definitions of succinct non-interactive arguments. Um, 
And uh, so one is slightly succinct, and then there are two that are distinct, but they're used interchangeably. Okay, so, but the core of it is something that's shorter and, and more compact than the statement you're trying to, to prove. Um, okay, and the SNARK paper added the, the second requirement there also that it should be very easy to verify uh, the statement that you're proving. Now, the reason why this succinctness is interesting, there are actually two reasons for that, right? I mean, the first one is that, of course, if you have a very succinct proof, it can't reveal too much of the witness, right? If you're only sending one kilobyte, you cannot reveal more than one kilobyte at most about the witness, right? So it almost automatically gives you some sort of privacy guarantee. And as a rule of thumb, whenever you have a succinct argument, right, it's typically very easy to make it completely, perfectly zero knowledge. And correspondingly, typically quite hard to make it sound. Um, so the other reason you could want very compact proofs, and I think why the second paper added this ease of verification requirement is also just, you know, forget about zero knowledge. Maybe that's not at all what you're interested in, but you're just interested in having very lightweight receivers that verify the proof. Okay. Okay, so again, now go back a year or two, 2010. Um, I had a paper uh, called Short Pairing Based Non Interactive Zero Knowledge Arguments, again, because the term zero knowledge stacks had not been invented yet. Uh, but that's essentially what it is, right? Um, and what I showed was that essentially I introduced the power of knowledge of exponent assumption uh, and then showed that you could construct constant size proofs, so a constant number of group elements um, at the cost of having a fairly large common reference string. Okay, so this is known as a pre-processing snark, we assume that it's fine to have the cost of setting up a long common reference string, but once you have that in place, then you want the proofs to be really succinct. Okay. It turned out that you can also do some balancing and get sort of like good things in, in both of the, the parameters, so you can get into the two-thirds elements in the common reference string and into the two-thirds of elements in the proof size where size of the circuit is uh, n elements. Okay. Um, okay, so very briefly, what is the idea here? Okay, essentially this proof of knowledge assumption says, okay, the only way you can compute these kind of related commitments here where one commitment is the other one to power alpha is if you actually know these group elements, okay? Um, and it turned out that this is something that really bugged people in the community, right? So, so actually this paper was rejected three times, right? So it's sort of like, you know, you submit this paper with snarks and people say, yeah, snarks. You know, who's, who's, who's going to use snarks, right? <laughs> I mean, who cares, right? Could there possibly be any value in snarks, right? Uh, which was a, a great frustration for me, right? And, and part of the reason I think was this knowledge of exponent assumption. It was a strong assumption. Nobody had seen that kind of assumption before, right? And of course, I've, at that time, since Gentrovix hadn't been published yet, I couldn't point to them and say, look, you just need it. I mean, if you want to have these really succinct proofs, there's no way about it, right? Um, and it's interesting to see sort of like the sociological change in the community, right? Because later when I've submitted SNARK papers, it's sort of like people are just, oh yeah, but you know, that's the kind of assumption you use in that field, in it goes, right? <laughs> okay, so let's see, I, I think I'm running a little short on time, it looks like. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, okay, so the core idea of this proof system was, was really, okay, to have a common reference strings which has group elements raised to some secret powers of, of X, okay? Uh, and that's something that we've used throughout in, in lots of uh, SNARK constructions, okay? And then, then you 
basically what you commit then is you know you take some elements and you raise them to a and, and multiply them together and the core idea is basically a balancing of polynomials okay so you, you work out the math and you pair two such commitments what you get is a polynomial in these secret x values okay um, and if you go through the math and you do that with another com polynomial you get some balance where you have some AIs and BIs minus CIs, where you want to prove that CI is the product of AI and BI, right? And if that's true, if the proof is honest, right, this left side just goes away, right? It's all raised to zero, out it goes. And then you have something where I is not equal to J, so you have like so, a lot of things with X raised to I and J N, where I and J are different from each other, and that's something you use the proof to cancel out. Okay, so moving on, um, following on that, there were a couple of works that did better. Uh, one was by Helga Lippmann, and it's actually a really nice idea of using some free sets, and sort of, it's sort of the same idea, but it makes it much more compact, and you actually get this quasi-linear size common reference string, right? And then, of course, GGPR, that introduced quadratic span programs and quadratic arithmetic programs, where they got a linear size common reference string. And the, the distinction here is, so it's still about balancing polynomials, right? So what is a quadratic arithmetic program or a quadratic span program? It's basically, we'll set up some polynomials in the exponent, and things will sort of like cancel out nicely whenever the proof is honest, right? But the difference was that they looked at evaluation points of polynomials. So where my construction had looked at the coefficients of polynomials and balance out the coefficients, they looked at evaluation points and making sure things balance out in the evaluation points. Okay, I wanted to, so, so basically these are proofs for arithmetic circuit satisfiability. Uh, I wanted to prove out one thing that I think people are not so aware of and maybe should be aware of, right? Of arithmetic circuit satisfiability, that's not just arithmetic circuit satisfiability, there's two versions of it. Right? Either you say, hey, just give me an arithmetic circuit, maybe some public inputs, and I'll prove that I have some, some private inputs to this that satisfies everything. Okay, that's sort of like the universal circuit arithmetic satisfiability. And then there's a specialized uh, circuit satisfiability where you have, this is a fixed circuit, and now I'll construct a common reference string that handles this specific circuit, okay? And, and one distinction between these two processes is that, well, these ones were for any circuit, okay? So that was sort of like part of something you could flexibly specify in the statement, whereas GGPR is for a fixed circuit. You design a specific common reference string that works for that circuit, okay? And of course, this is something that sort of re-emerged when we started looking at updatable common reference string. This theme suddenly popped back up uh, again, okay? Um, so if you're using GDPR, well, you can just take a universal circuit, but then you're paying a logarithmic overhead for, for that. Okay, so, so let's um, put things together. So past, present, and, and future, what does this pattern look like? Um, so so I, I thought I wanted to sort of uh, create an, a graph, an tr evolutionary tree of, of what was the developments here, and I realized that there are just too many papers that I can possibly put in one graph. So, so what I'm trying to do here is instead map out the ideas that have uh, developed here, right? So, so we're starting with zero-knowledge proofs, right? We had all these kind of different works, perfect zero-knowledge, non-interactive zero-knowledge, succinctness that works for all of NP and Schnorr is efficient, uh, proofs, and, and, and pairing based non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs really started from, from this question, right? Combining non-interactive zero-knowledge and uh, perfect zero-knowledge, right? Can we get both of them, right? And it turned out if we use pairings, yes, you can do that, right? And then the next question was, okay, can you get something for efficient language? So this was pairing based non-interactive zero-knowledge and this is non-interactive zero-knowledge for pairings. <laughs> okay, 
And then, of course, there was all this work on, on discrete log-based proofs where we had, you know, got sort of succinct sigma protocols. And that was actually an inspiration, right, in, in this work on getting pairing-based snarks, right? Putting together non-interactive journals, uh, um, pairing-based non-interactive journals with this succinctness and sort of playing those two ideas together. Now you get pairing-based snarks. Okay, and, and there you had to, again, introduce something new ingredient, namely the knowledge of exponent assumption. Okay, and I think what we're seeing now is actually a very exciting sort of phase transition again. I really think the field has changed because people have been looking at sort of practical implementation. How will this actually work, right? Uh, and, and the applications, distributed ledgers, cryptocurrencies, and so forth has all driven this this work really, right? Um, right, so, <laughs> so here we have you know, the marriage of, of theory and, and, and practice, I think, right? Uh, where we're starting with, starting with Pinocchio and then since with later on, Lipstark, for instance, uh, implementing snarks, right? And, and starting doing some, some really heavy engineering. And I think one of the big differences is actually I mean, what is really happening here? I think we're changing language, right? So there's a lot of talk about rank one constraint satisfaction assumptions, right? Which is essentially arithmetic circuit satisfiability, right? But I think the really big change here is, is this development of, of front ends, right? That can take it sort of a general piece of computation and, and compile that into something that we can do snarks on, right? So what we're really seeing, seeing is, again, a change of language, right? I mean, the language with, that we're proving right now is actually general purpose computation, right? You can take a program written in C and you can start proving that it has been executed correctly, right? And that's completely different kind of language and something I think, you know, go back more than 10 years, all right? But then back then we had no idea that, you know, we would get to this stage, right? So that's a really remarkable uh, development. Okay, so looking a little towards the future, I actually have very little to say about the future, who knows, um, <laughs> right? But I think we've seen sort of these, this focus, I mean, on language, right? We're pairing friendly language and rank one constraint, and now we are looking at general computation, right? It really speaks to what is the applicability of SNARKs, right? And I think, you know, the next question is something that we have already touched on in, in this workshop is, you know, you know, what is the high level programming language we should use to specify these kind of uh, uh, statements, right? So all this work on, on front ends and compilers is really interesting and also questions about interoperability now, right? It's also essentially a question about what kind of language are we talking about that we want to prove thing about, right? Um, security, right? Um, lots of things, I didn't really touch on this, right? But there's questions, for instance, you know, where do you get your setup from, which I think actually has come much more, in, uh, become much more prominent, I think. Back in the days, again, you know, you said, okay, we have a common reference string, you know, it just came from this guy, right? And now we have a common reference string, we can write our crypto paper, right? But now, you know, people are looking at, you know, how do you actually, where do you get that from, right? Uh, so that's sort of like been an interesting thing where, where I think practice really influences uh, theory. And of course, this goes to the question of, you know, how can we build trustworthy uh, snarks? And I think there's a lot more to be done there, right? I mean, this formal verification of, of the kind of security proofs that we have, right? Because we know that sometimes they have bugs in them. Um, and I think there's also a question of, you know, how do you make this usable and how do you convince people who are outside the cryptographic community that this actually works and is secure, right? And, uh, and not just convince them, but actually convince them because it is true that it's secure, right? <laughs> uh, I, I think that's an uh, interesting uh, unsolved problem, right? I mean, how do you actually, you know, convince people who are outside the community? Convince yourself and then apply whatever you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll go out and be a math teacher, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and then there's been lots of, interesting things done in, on the efficiency side, right? Of course, early on we started with composite order groups, right? But now we switched to asymmetric pairings because those are the most efficient. Um, 
it's been very nice works on nesting of proofs. So I really like this, uh, this idea of, of having, you know, different elliptic curves that map into each other and suddenly you can prove things about and you get fully succinct uh, snarks. Um, commit and prove again properly is going to give us efficiency, right? Because now you don't have to commit many times to the same thing over and over. Uh, so it's really a question of making these proofs cost effective, right? And all of this, you know, if we succeed, not just in SNARK, but in zero knowledge in general, right? I mean, I think uh, hopefully it will have a, a huge uh, impact on, on society, right? I would like to see this in, you know, every office and every house that they're using uh, uh, SNARKs, right? So, so uh, final step of the evolution is to create this uh, invasive species. Uh, thank you. We have time for one question. Yeah. Right, so, so I think that the most fascinating fact so far in the conference is that the, the paper got rejected three times with the first uh, <laughs> succinct snark without yeah. random oracle. But right, Ivan Damgard, he introduced the non-power KOE many years before. So did he also get rejected three times? Or do you think the DPKE is harder to swallow than just the one so, knowledge? I mean, so, so one thing that I think is interesting, I, I think there is a qualitative difference, right? So, so I did spend quite some time looking at whether, you know, the simple version of the knowledge of exponent assumption could apply the bigger version of knowledge exponent assumption. As far as I can tell, it does not, right? So there does seem to be a, qualitative difference uh, between them. Um, now, I have no clue how many times Evans' paper was rejected, but I mean, I know from my own work that rejection is sort of the norm. I mean, so this is not the only one that was rejected. Cross the high proofs was rejected twice. Um, uh, let's see. The, the, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I, I say say to myself, you know, to, to console myself. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I did actually, in, in the first versions, uh, it was not written like that. It was written in terms of, of culpable soundness, which is sort of, I think, a better notion of security, but something that people didn't really accept. And it takes quite a lot of time to actually convince people that it's the right notion of uh, zero knowledge in, in the non-interactive zero knowledge. I mean, so, so there was an evolution in, in the write-up of the paper uh, along the way. Right? So nothing about the, instead of the knowledge assumption, just saying, okay, Yeah, so, so I mean, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't know that whether that would be easier to swallow or, or, or not. <laughs> I have the microphone, so you I, 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 here. I, I just wanted to add the, to the list of rejected papers uh, that uh, I have a paper with Odette Goldreich on the composition of zero knowledge uh, that was uh, rejected from, I think, Fox 89 because we, we had too many papers on zero knowledge already. <laughs> <laughs> little, little they knew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's thank Jens one more time. Thank you.